Good morning. Um, it's an enormous pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I'm very, very excited. I've been looking forward to this for many, many months. It's also a great honor for me to follow Dr. Wayne Jonas, someone who I've admired for a long time, had a chance to meet because uh, I was part of the Samuelis uh, project back when I was at UC Irvine. Uh, I hope that the work of Dr. Jonas changes how we work. Uh, I hope it has as big an impact as Larry Weed did when he developed problem-oriented medical records. I hope that I can have some impact on changing what we do uh, as we work. So I think our two presentations are going to complement each other a great deal. Now this talk uh, is a truth to power type presentation. It's a call to arms for family medicine. And it's one where I'm going to ask you for the next half hour to get out of your guidelines driven current medical box that you work in and just go on a journey with me. I'd like to start at the beginning. Daniel Lieberman is a very popular evolutionary biology professor at Harvard whose research has been on numerous hominid species. He went public a few years ago with a book, The Story of the Human Body. It's one of those books that I've read twice in order to digest it. He wrote this book because he's concerned that we're in a state of disevolution. We are becoming a less healthy species. And it is due to our departure from our evolutionary body into an industrial age. Brief uh, thumbnail sketch, human species arrived on Earth about two and a half million years ago. We departed from the chimpanzees and the bonobos about five million years ago. Went through a number of pre-human species, the osteopiths like Lucy. Uh, but the hominids have been around for two and a half million years. Homo sapiens arrived on the scene about 300,000 years ago, is now the latest. When, the, when his book came out, it was 220,000, so who knows what will be found later. But we shared the planet with other hominids until 30,000 years ago. And so for 97% of our existence on Earth as Homo sapiens, we lived on the food of nature. We got up in the morning, we hunted, we gathered, we played on a good day, and we feasted and we slept. Got up the next morning and repeated. We ate one meal a day and we ate the food of nature. That is our evolutionary body for 97% of our time on Earth. We have a hunter-gatherer body living in an industrial age culture. And that has resulted in a lot of progress Tremendous progress for our human species, tremendous population explosion, but it has created mismatch diseases. And he describes and goes through detail a whole list of mismatch diseases I'm going to show you. Now, Lieberman quotes polymath genius Jared Diamond. Many of you have read some of his books. But he wrote in back in the 1980s that the worst mistake the human race ever made was to start to eat grasses. We're not designed to eat grasses. We don't graze in the fields like cows or other grass-eating mammals. Yet, we figured out how to turn grasses into flour. And wheat, oats, barley, rye, rice became staples of our diet. Yet, they are not our evolutionary food. They have an enormous glycemic load, which was not part of our life before, leading to overweight, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. And many of them have inflammatory proteins that adversely affect our gut microbiome. They create dysbiosis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, permeability that you hear about as leaky gut, with proteins getting into our system, interpreted as foreign bodies, we form antibodies to them, and that's now the leading postulation for the origin of most anti-inflammatory diseases. Uh, this cartoon is kind of funny, uh, if it weren't so true. Um, 
Uh, we evolve, we do the best we can with what we've got, and we figure things out, but we don't always do things right, ultimately. This is a list, a partial list, from Lieberman's book on mismatched diseases. Diseases that do not have to happen if we were true to our proper nutrition and active lifestyle, we would not have all of these diseases. They are completely preventable, and because miraculously the body likes to heal, as long as we have some telomeres and stem cells there, which we do into our 80s, uh, we can reverse all of these diseases. But unfortunately, this is America. The majority of Americans are overweight, now 40% are obese, we have high blood sugars, which is gonna greatly accelerate the Alzheimer's disease epidemic. It's now estimated that our population, 50% of Americans will have Alzheimer's by 85. As of year 2000, it was one in three. The healthiest populations on earth, places where more people live to over 100 than anywhere else, Alzheimer's disease is very rare. The determinants of health, this is sociology of health, shelter and safety and clean water are the most vital things for health in a community. But good food ranks high, it's fourth. Proper nutrition. Interestingly enough, our medical care comes in seventh after education and meaningful work. Tolstoy, sort of borrowing from family therapy here, that, uh, to, to sort of rephrase Tolstoy, all healthy bodies are alike, but each unhealthy body is unhealthy in its own way. That's why it's so interesting to do lifestyle medicine, to do it the way J Wayne Jonas talks about what matters and put it in the context of the person, and then to deal with elements of their lifestyle to restore health. And by the way, what I'm presenting applies to all populations. It is less expensive to eat healthy than it is to eat unhealthy. If you don't believe it, look it up. Now there are some pioneers that I've learned from. Sarah Hallberg is a really cool doctor. I urge that you all listen to her TEDx talk. It's 18 minutes long. It's been viewed by millions of people. But Sarah at the University of Indiana in Indianapolis runs an intensive dietary management program where she reverses obesity and diabetes. She says, and we, Larry and I know her, she says, give me any type two diabetic and I'll make them a non-diabetic, no drugs, normal blood sugar within two weeks to three months. How? Just stop eating food we don't need. There are no essential carbohydrates. There are essential fatty acids that we must eat to be healthy. There are essential amino acids we must eat to be healthy. But there are no essential carbohydrates. The hunter-gatherer in most parts of the world ate a very low percentage of carbohydrates. Today, the Inuit in the Arctic living on caribou and the Maasai and Sambu tribes of Africa do fine on a zero carbohydrate diet. They get their vitamin C from the bone marrow and other minerals and things like that. So she ignores the guidelines, the American Diabetes Association, heavily funded by the food industry, trains dietitians, diabetic educators to prescribe a 65% carbohydrate diet to diabetics. It's like prescribing alcohol to alcoholics. It's insane. But carbohydrates are by far the most profitable food commodity. Eric Westman at Duke does the same thing. A low carbohydrate, healthy fat diet at Duke, he cures diabetes and obesity. These are all videos you can see on the web. Uh, Westman was one of the pioneers of using fasting. One of the best things the human body can do is to not eat. As I said, we ate one meal a day. They call that the warrior diet today. Uh, but you will flip the switch uh, if you can get people to eat healthier foods less often. And when you give up the carbs, you're, you give up hunger. 
Carbs drive hunger. Jason Fung at the University of Toronto has probably articulated the best. And his 2016 book, The Obesity Code, took Occam's razor to a problem that we talk about as being so complex. And he basically says, the problem with obesity is insulin. Now we're all taught in medical school that insulin drives glucose into cells, that's its role. Lip insulin is a fat storage hormone. It is the hormone behind turning glucose into body fat. All the glucose you don't burn becomes fat. So that dessert in the evening and that martini and two glasses of wine and you're not gonna burn that off before you go to bed, the insulin is contributing to your developing fat overnight. It also locks the door to burning fat. When we stress our body with a load of carbohydrates, we basically shut down any possibility of burning fat. People in the fitness center working out, trying to get rid of a little body fat, and they finish it and get some pancakes and orange juice are wasting their time. Maybe they'll burn off a little more of the glucose and get a little bit less fat, but they're not gonna burn any fat. We have to burn off the carbohydrates, usually way more than our body wants, before we'll burn off any fat. The, uh, it's all about insulin, and what happens, as you'll see if you read the diabetes code, is that if you repeatedly stress your body with carbohydrate loads, pretty soon the body says, we need to get resistant to this insulin. Let's stop the insulin from working. We can't take any more. So the blood sugar goes up and we become insulin resistant. It's a defense mechanism to our malnutrition. And that becomes type two diabetes, which is a high blood sugar. And then we treat high blood sugar because all we care about are numbers, like hemoglobin A1C and, diabetes and that blood sugar. We care about numbers so we give them long-acting insulin to get those numbers down, and sure enough, at the next visit, they're five pounds heavier because we've added to their truncal obesity, driving insulin resistance. Insulin's the hormone that drives these illnesses. People who eat healthy fat and protein and are low glycemic have a very stable blood sugar. Our body is perfectly capable of making our blood sugar out of fat and protein and it'll choose fat first before it'll ever burn protein unless you're silly enough to give yourself a high protein shake or high protein bars because our body doesn't store protein. So all the extra protein you eat is turned into sugar through gluconeogenesis. We need adequate protein, 15% or so of the diet. Uh, we need healthy fats. David uh, Ludwig at Harvard has got a long big bibliography on the obesity insulin axis and has articulated for science how clear this is. And his book is called Always Hungry, being driven by our excess carbohydrate society. David Ludwig, it's, I mean, uh, David, uh, Robert Lustig, I'm sorry, is a very, very angry pediatric endocrinologist <laughs> in San Francisco. And it, all you have to do is read his work. Fat Chance, The Hacking of the American Mind. What really makes Lustig angry, because he has a whole clinic of way overweight children with type 2 diabetes, is that they're becoming fatty liver very early as children. Why are they getting fatty liver? Because in America, we no longer actually even produce sugar. It's all offshore. The labor costs of sugar are now too high. But our friendly corn farmers have got a solution. High fructose corn syrup. It tastes just like sugar. All the sodas. As a matter of fact, some people are onto this, so I got given a beverage the other night where you'll see on a beverage made with real sugar. And you might go, why are they advertising the sugar? Well, they're advertising the fact that it doesn't have high fructose corn syrup. But your salad dressings, most of your sodas, most of the sweeteners, 
today because it's very cheap, tastes the same. It's a foreign substance to our livers. Our liver looks at this, tries to deal with it. It's an imbalance of, of sucrose and fructose and it causes inflammation in the liver leading to fatty liver. So we now have fatty liver in children thanks to what Lust, or Lustig calls the Voldemort of all foods. <laughs> now I mentioned to you, besides these pioneers of reversing overweight obesity and type two diabetes, I mentioned to you the inflammatory proteins and what we've done to our gut microbiome. Pretty much all of the GI problems, from acid peptic problems to irritable bowel, the GERD, and even the development of Crohn's disease and ulcerative, ulcerative colitis are related to our unhealthy gut microbiome. Now, a lot of people in science like to talk about the gut microbiome kind of like this separate and independent organ. It is completely determined by what we eat. It doesn't come from anywhere else. So the microbiome of an Amazon jungle person or the hunter-gatherer and a modern person living on a lot of grains will have a different microbiome. And what grains do to the microbiome is they cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, and inflammatory proteins. Robin Chutkin, a gastroenterologist from Georgetown, has started a clinic in Washington, D.C. just for the reversal of GI problems in women. Her first book, Gut Bliss, was very popular. The microbiome solution goes into how she changes the microbiome and reverses all chronic GI problems, including inflammatory bowel disease. There's her uh, copy of her three different books, but I recommend the microbiome solution. Your patients might enjoy gut bliss and the bloat cure. Gerard Mullen is a gastroenterologist at Johns Hopkins. As a pre-med, he weighed over 400 pounds. They told him he probably wouldn't go to medical school. So he got a degree in nutrition, became lean, went to medical school, became a gastroenterologist at Johns Hopkins where he's now on the faculty, and he runs a clinic on reversing GI problems using healthy nutrition. His book is called The Gut Balance Revolution. All these published this decade. Terry Walls was a professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. In her 40s, she developed debilitating multiple sclerosis. She went on the drugs, some of the new biologicals, they made her sick and didn't reverse her disease. She decided to take things in her own hand and figure out the most anti-inflammatory diet she could possibly find to see if that helped her. She went on an intensive anti-inflammatory diet along with other elements of a healthy lifestyle and completely reversed her multiple sclerosis. Is now back at work, running her clinic, traveling the world, but her clinic is now devoted to an anti-inflammatory approach to people with autoimmune disease, not just multiple sclerosis. Does a lot of this work also on the internet. Her book, The Walls Protocol, spells it out in detail. I ask our leading multiple sclerosis investigator at the University of California, San Diego, if he knew about Dr. Walls. He goes, oh, I've heard a little bit about her. I think she's into self-promotion or something, isn't she? Uh, she's not a neurologist, is not respected by the neurologic community. Cancer risks are all part of this obesity epidemic. The big, I thought, the, the one of the hardest breakthrough things that happened is the Dale Bredesen story. Dale Bredesen is a research neurologist at UCLA. He spent over 20 years looking for the magic bullet in Alzheimer's disease. And he was part of the work heavily funded by the drug industry that was successful at dissolving amylin plaques and tau protein bundles. The amylin plaques are outside the neuron, the tau protein bundles are inside the neuron. And when you dissolve those things, guess what happens? The patients get worse. Those are scar tissue of the inflammatory insult that contributes to Alzheimer's disease. Now a fortuitous thing happened. 
Dale Bredesen's wife is a family doc. She trained in functional medicine. She runs a functional medicine practice, and I believe in Santa Monica. And she basically said to her husband, you're never gonna fix Alzheimer's until you fix the lifestyle. So he decided to test it. He used sort of a full court press functional medicine approach to a patient with early Alzheimer's disease, well documented, and it's a matter of nutrition, various supplements, various things. It's one thing you, when you learn functional medicine, it's kind of like everything in the kitchen sink. But this lady reversed her cognitive decline. She developed normal intelligence again. He published this case report in 2014 in the journal Aging. Two years later, he published a series of 11 patients that he reversed their cognitive decline. That began to get a little bit of press. UCLA doctor shows improvement or reversal of Alzheimer's disease, poo-pooed mostly by the scientific community. I mean, after all, it's only 11 patients. He's now reversed more than 200 patients. He wants to give this protocol, which he's refined through the time. It's now called the 3.0. He calls it RECODE, reversing cognitive decline. And uh, he's basically allowing, you can do it online, you can do it at workshops, you can be trained in the Bredesen protocol. And lots of people in various places, you'll see it. We're doing it at Eisenhower, uh, is, uh, is begin to apply the protocol. It's very early. It works, but we really don't know completely what works. Bredesen does know one thing, though. Sugar is toxic to the brain. There's a direct linear relationship between your fasting blood sugar and your rate of brain atrophy. There's three ways to get Alzheimer's in general, atrophy, inflammation, and toxins. You need to look at it through all of those. But sugar is the number one contributor. People will not reverse their cognitive decline until their fasting blood sugar is below 90 and their fasting insulin is below five. Fasting insulin is now my most commonly looked at and followed blood test. Jason Fung uses it for reversing obesity and diabetes. You gotta get the fasting insulin below 10 before any lipolysis begins. And uh, Bredesen shows you need to get it below five to reverse cognitive decline. My fasting sugar is 85 and my fasting insulin is 4.5. I walk the talk. And that's a centerpiece. Obviously, uh, Bredesen uses what he calls the healthy Mediterranean diet, no pasta, low carbohydrate, and intermittent fasting to achieve uh, those ends. Our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. Now, we've always kind of thought that as a quaint old uh, comment by Hippocrates, but uh, after going with Larry and the gang to Greece and uh, visiting the Hippocratic Institute on the island of Kos, it's, uh, it's uh, more profound. But Maimonides kind of says it best, the great 12th century physician, for any disease that can be treated by diet should not be treated any other way. We spend more money on drugs for type 2 diabetes than all of Major League Baseball, the National Football League, and the National Basketball Association combined. It is a huge industry of completely unnecessary drugs, many of which make the underlying disease worse. We are stooges for a drug industry. We're also stooges for a food industry that heavily funds the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, making sure that grains and carbs remain a centerpiece of the American diet. Paul Farmer talks about pathologies of power, human rights, and the war on the poor. Our refined carbohydrates and sugar is a pathology of power here in America. It is structural violence that the food industry puts profits over health. Human rights are fundamental 
Health rights are a fundamental to human rights. This is a town in Mexico that does not have clean water. The children drink Coca-Cola for fluids and diabetes has become rampant. On the left, you'll see a little Nestle food cart. Nestle is paying children in the flavelas of Rio and other cities in Brazil to pass an all sugar food cart of snacks. Sugar and refined carbs are highly addictive. They're the only foods we become addicted to. It's the same addiction centers that are in the brain. As a matter of fact, if you get rats addicted to both cocaine and sugar and give them a choice, they go to the sugar. We don't get addicted to broccoli and carrots, but we do, and we give our sugar addiction sweet names, like I have a sweet tooth uh, that we need to satisfy. That's like an alcoholic satisfying with alcohol. I work with Indio High School. Indio is a city of Hispanic patients, all low income, service workers and farm workers. Jason Tate is an incredible health academy leader at Indio High School. He's devoted to restoring health at Indio High School. His goal is that every student who enters the high school will leave healthier than they came in. He runs a pre-med program, a health academy, in which hundreds of children attend and learn healthy nutrition and lifestyle and take it home to their parents. But what he's found in a study that we're working to get published is that for the low-income students, there's a federally funded food program that serves breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon after-school snack so that these long working parents don't have to worry about their kids having anything to eat. To be healthy, we really shouldn't eat more than about 50 grams of carbs in a day from whole fruit and vegetables. That food program has an average of 275 grams of carbs with 165 grams of sugar every day inducing overweight, obesity, and type 2 diabetes in these children. But why? It's because this food program is heavily subsidized. It's literally given to the schools. They don't have to buy the food. We have the science, the technology, and the affluence for global health and meeting the basic needs of everyone, as Paul Farmer says. We need to take it to the pharma and food industry like we did tobacco. Now the lifestyle medicine, if you look at it in functional medicine, begins with nutrition. You can't be healthy without a healthy diet. You gotta start in the gut. It's 80% of the equation. Now these other things are important. Physical activity, stress management, good sleep, being social, having meaning and purpose, love and be loved. These are all elements of being a lifestyle oriented. But most of the others are enabled by a person whose mood is very stable all day. They don't have a bouncing, fluctuated blood sugar with hunger, anger, various emotions. It's helpful. It's a very important starting point. Start delivering lifestyle medicine to your individuals, your groups, regionally and globally. Cure disease rather than just palliate the disease. Don't be stooges. Now you may feel like the little boy on the beach throwing starfish back in, saving a few lives while thousands will die, but you're saving those lives locally. You can get involved locally to bring in healthy food like Michelle Obama did with the White House by getting gardens planted. It is cheaper to eat healthy. You eat 35% less calories. Food stamps are being spent on things like soda, but they're no different than the rest of the American society in terms of its shopping. So I have found that being a lifestyle-oriented physician to restore health incredibly rewarding. I urge you to begin to shift in that direction. You can have some of your faculty train in functional medicine or lifestyle medicine, 
There are, it's, a, it's a rapidly growing area. When I attended the basic course, Applying Functional Medicine to Clinical Practice in Austin, a room bigger than this, and they do it several times a year in different cities, they ask who's in the audience, and family physicians were the most common physicians that were present in the audience. So our colleagues are beginning to do this. It's a restoring health movement. I hope you'll get on board. Thank you very much.